Good evening. Good evening to all of our friends online. Good evening to all of you here tonight. Weathered the warm weather to get here. And <clears throat> it's very, very... I feel bad. To, my wife is in New York right now, and it's freezing cold. It's going to be snowing there tomorrow. Hopefully she'll be able to get her flight back. And over here we're at 72, 75 degrees. Uh, okay, we're in the fifth class, fifth official class of the five books in five weeks. Now, I know that a few of them had to be adjusted because of, you know, weather conditions here in Houston. We had, to, you know, a couple of weeks that we, were, we had a challenging schedule. Either way, today will be hopefully the final class of the five books in five weeks. So buckle up because we are going to blast through numbers and Deuteronomy today. So get ready. Uh, we left off last week uh, last week with the end of Leviticus, and we discussed the end of Leviticus that God had the um, the blessings and the admonitions or, or or curses that if we follow the laws of of God, is good reward ready to be paid, and if we don't, God forbid, there is uh, not so good to be paid. Penalty. Yes, so. Uh, now we start Bamidbar, which is the book of Numbers, and uh, it, this book deals with the divine providence, the Jewish people travel, and they live as Jews. It's not only to learn n- enough to learn about Judaism, we have to actually live it. And here's the, the book where we experience the Jews actually living as Jews. So, and if you remember, we had many, many, many commandments given to us in Leviticus. I don't have the exact number here. It's on the new printout of this series. Again, if anybody wants these notes, you're welcome to email me and I will send you all of the notes from these classes from the entire five books in five weeks series. So, Bamidbar, the first portion of the book of Numbers. Uh, Actually, the first three deal with the encampment around the tabernacle. As we know, there was a specific order that the Jewish people needed to be camped around the tabernacle. And every tribe had its own flag. Every tribe had its own identity. Every, every tribe was going to get its own portion in the land of Israel. And it's important to note, we mentioned this in one of the other classes this week. Someone was asking about why are there so many different uh, at, you know, elements in Judaism. You have the Sephardic, the Ashkenazic, you have the Hasidic, you have, you know, the, the, the Lithuanian Jews, the, you know, all of the, even just within the Hungarian Jews or the Hasidic dynasties, you have uh, hundreds of different Hasidic dynasties. And they were thinking that it was sort of a contradiction. I said, no, it's been by design like this from day one, where we, we see the Jewish people had 12 different tribes. Every tribe had different different perspective. Every tribe had different qualities and different different challenges that they were going to face. And we see that also in the blessings of Jacob that he was giving his children, the tribes, everyone had their own uniqueness. This one's going to be a businessman. This one's going to be a Torah scholar. This one is going to be a priestly tribe. And this one is going to be a, you know, a traveler. Right? We have all of these different tribes. That's fine. Everyone is different. Everyone is unique and everyone has to find their own way. But the fundamental principles remain the same. And that is the Shabbos remains the Shabbos for everyone. The, the, you know, saying the prayers that we pray every day is the same for everyone. The order may be different in the details of which psalm goes where and, you know, (coughs) which parts come first, which parts come last. But everyone agrees you have to pray. And in, with tefillin, Right? The order and how the actual portions of the Torah are placed inside the boxes of the tefillin, the squares of the tefillin, well, there's different orders. But everyone agrees you have to wear tefillin. So it's, it's fine to have a different opinion. Obviously, it has to be sourced. And we know, we know this from our Talmud Lunch Learn on Fridays, there is no just... You know, why don't we just try it like this, just for, you know, you know for variety. There's no such thing. It, it, we, we, we're, we're living in a culture where people say, oh, why not? I, I, you know, I don't want to get too off track. We have a lot of ground to cover, so let's hit the road. So, number one, why is it called numbers? Because the Jewish people are numbered numerous times in this book. The first thing that happens in 
the book of Numbers is the Jewish people accounted. There's a census. We have the tribal leaders that are that are, are selected. We have different tribe camps, and we have a total count of 603,550 people between the ages of 20 and 60 of the male gender, right? You times that by two, plus children, plus adult, plus seniors over the age of 60. I would like to say youngsters over the age of 60, and you have many, many millions of Jews, and that is all excluding Levites, right? The, the camping formation is designated. The appointment of the Levites, uh, the redeeming, the mitzvah of the redeeming of all firsts, so the first of our crops, the first of our animals, the first of our children, are all, those laws are, are, are uh, clearly uh, stated in this, in this parsha as well. And we have the total Levite count of 22,000 Levites. The firstborn are redeemed, the Kohanites are organized, and the special precautions for the Kohanites are also listed at the end of the first portion of Numbers. The second portion of Numbers is Naso, which I believe is the longest Parsha. It has the most amount of verses. Anybody know how many verses? 167, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, give me a quick second here. One hundred and seventy-six. One hundred seventy-six. And interestingly, if you look at the largest page, the largest book in the Talmud, which is Baba Batra, it also has one hundred and seventy-six pages. We can get into that another time as to why it's not a coincidence either, uh, but we'll see that another time. Pages. Yeah. Not including page one, obviously. There's no page one, right? You remember why there's no page one? <coughs> remember? Anybody remember why there's no page one? I'll tell you a quick story. I think I mentioned this in the class yesterday. Uh, yesterday. Uh, one of the classes. Why is there no page one? Oh, actually, this was Shabbos, the Shabbos class. I'm sorry. So what happened was, is that... Um, I'll tell you an interesting story. And from the story, you'll understand why not. Um, there was the great Satmar Rebbe, the, the great leader of the Satmar dynasty, one of the biggest Hasidic dynasties in the world. Actually, we have his book here. The book is called The Rebbe. Um, now, many people know the Rebbe as being the, the Lubavitch Rebbe, but he's not the only one. He's in good company with about another hundred uh, Hasidic dynasties, and everyone calls their Rebbe the Rebbe, right? So uh, you have many Rebbe's, all great people, um, and with fantastic uh, dynasties that they left um, after them. So this great uh, uh, Satma Rebbe, after the Holocaust, arrived in New York, and he had very, very few uh, followers, and he was about to reestablish the whole, you know, the whole movement. And uh, he lived in Williamsburg, and um, where they still are, um, most of them. And uh, he was barely able to get a minion together, and then, you know, after he was able to somewhat get a regular minion, he announced <coughs> that he's starting a new class in Talmud. A new class in Talmud. And they come to learn the Talmud. And the rabbi opens up the book of Talmud. And sure enough, he doesn't begin the Talmud. He starts telling them stories. And they talk about many things that are going on. And day one, successful Talmud class had not... I had not ushered in the first word of Talmud yet. And the second day, same thing. Stories and other stories and things, you know, just... After a couple of days, one of the, one of the, the followers says, you know, Rebbe, you know, this is supposed to be a Talmud class, not a story class. And it looks like, you know, we, we, haven't, even touched the, we haven't even touched the surface yet. We haven't... So he said, oh, you want, you want to begin learning Talmud? No problem. Open up to page one. So he opens up. There is no page one. He says, why isn't there page one? He says, be before you get to page two, you have to do your own page one. You have to be ready. You have to prepare yourself. He says, everyone here just went through terrible trauma, lost their family, lost their, lost, many of them lost their spouse, lost their children, lost their parents, lost everything. They still need a page one. When we're done with page one, then we can turn to page two. And that's why the Talmud begins. We also discussed 
how why the Torah begins with the letter Bet. The Torah begins with Bereshit. Where is letter Aleph? It should start off with the first letter of the Torah. Why does it start with the second? Well, there's there there are things that need to come before you start learning the Torah, and we mentioned this. Number one is we have to use our common sense. Common sense is A. It's the A of of the Aleph of the Torah. Second is we have to understand the fundamental principle of Aleph. What is Aleph? God. Godliness. Aluf. God is the master of the universe. And God is hidden. If you're expecting to open the Torah and find God openly, it's going to be very difficult for you. Obviously, God is all over the place, but you have to be ready to see God. God is going to be hidden through His works, through His majesty that's in this world. And it's not just going to be open. You're going to have to search for God. And you're going to have to find God within yourself. So the Aleph is hidden. It starts with Beth. Okay, now. So the Kohanites are organized and then we have the special precautions for the, for the, for the Kohanites. Uh, special precautions for the Kohanites. Second portion is Naso. Naso means to travel. And then we have the distribution of responsibilities. We have the recounting of the Jewish people. We have the purification of the camp, repenting for theft. And then we have a very, very, very important portion in the Torah, which is Sota. Anybody remember what the Sota is? That's an, a suspected adult, adulteress. A woman who is suspected by her husband of having an affair. And what does the Torah tell us about that? That she, would, she was accused by her husband as having an affair. And what would happen is they, they would br bring her to court. And the court would have her uncover her hair and drink a certain uh, potion that had God's name <coughs> melted into the water. And then she would drink it. If she was innocent, she would be blessed with amazing children. She would be blessed with unbelievable blessings. And if she was guilty, as charged, because obviously we don't have witnesses, we don't have any, if there were witnesses, we wouldn't have to get to such a situation. But here we have no witnesses, just an, an allegation from her husband. So we don't know. And because uh, fidelity in marriage is so critical in Judaism, so we have no solution other than God's doing a miracle. And if she was indeed guilty, the, the drink would kill her from inside. She would die and it would be over. The next portion after this, and the Torah goes into details about this, the next portion, immediately, not portion, portion, but the next part right after this is talking about the Nazarite. The Nazarite is someone who uh, removes himself from worldly pleasures, removes himself from uh, from uh, you know drinking wine, from growing his hair, and so on and so, and so forth. So the obvious question would be, why is one next to the other? Why is one next to the other? Why do you have the sota, the the uh, the alleged suspected adulteress, right next to the portion of the Nazarite? She's the one who loves so, so so our sages tell us that if. Someone who sees a suspected adulteress in her. Let me find the actual verse for you. Uh, Rashi says over here. One who sees a woman in such a state should immediately remove himself from wine. Why? Temptation. Because what brought this woman to her state? A little bit of looseness, a little bit of lightheadedness. It's a, there's a reason, our sages tell us, there's a reason why you need to see something. And the reason you needed to see this woman in this state is to give you a warning. Stay away from wine. And that's why our sages tell us, immediately after talking about the sota, we immediately go to the portion of, of, of the Nazir, the Nazarite. The Nazarite who refrains from certain worldly pleasures. The idea is, is that we have to take note. When we see things, we have to wake up ourselves. 
we see a story in the news about uh, you know some terrible <clears throat> terrible thing that that was done. Why did I have to see that piece of news? I could have turned on the news another three minutes later, and I wouldn't have to see that piece. But guess what? <clears throat> it's preordained, so to speak, from the Almighty that we need to see this to wake ourselves up to be a little bit more sensitive in a certain area. There's no, there's no coincidence in Judaism. We don't believe in coincidence. It's divine. Okay? It's pre- so then we have sudden contamination discussed in that portion, priestly blessings. A uh, very interesting part of priestly blessings is that priests themselves, it says, It's Samud Shmi al Bnei Yisrael v'ani avarachem. God tells, tells the Kohen, Kohen, the Kohanim, God tells them, you put my name on them and I will bless them. It means you're just a conduit through which my blessing will flow. But you yourself don't have any powers per se. Uh, I think that same concept goes with all of us to understand that when we uh, give a blessing to someone or if someone gives a blessing to us, it is opening up a channel through which blessing can come to us. But that person doesn't have the power to put anything on us. Uh, it has to be uh, willed from the Almighty from up in heaven. Priestly blessings. Offering of tribal leaders and Moshe enters the tabernacle and the altar is dedicated. We have then, third portion is Baha'alotcha. And we talk about the menorah. We have the consecration of the Levites. We have Passover in the desert. We have the offerings, the trumpets, the order of breakdown of the camp. We have Jethro is invited to join the Jewish people. We have the journey begins. The ark travels. We know the ark was a special miracle. The ark carried the people. The people didn't carry the ark. Right? It's an amazing thing. You think, oh, I'm so strong. I'm going to carry this ark. Just by the way, the, you know, there was a video that went around. It was going viral of, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the trophy. Uh, what's that trophy called? The, uh, the, for, the, for, the, for the winning... Vince Lombardi. Vince Lombardi trophy. <laughs> you see people going over. They're, they're, they're touching it. They're kissing it. <laughs> to distinguish not to distinguish between holy and unholy, and here the unholy is the Vince Lombardi trophy, the holy, we do this every single time we take out the Torah. Every single time the Torah is removed from the ark, we go to that Torah, which is our life. Now, for a football player, their life, sadly, is... The trophy, that's what they're living for. We're not living for a trophy. We're living for a connection with the Almighty. What's that connection through the Torah? When we take out the Torah, we jump out of our seats. You know you're not allowed to sit when the ark is open. Ark is open, you have to stand. When the Torah is out, you have to stand. In fact, I was learning this with my children just uh, last week, that when the Torah is outside of the ark, you're not allowed to leave the temple. Till it goes back into the ark. Because that is our life's blood. That is the essence of who we are, is the Torah. Not the trophy. It's not just the trophy. It's not something we'll put on the mantle. It's something that is supposed to be in our soul. In, in, our, in our flesh. right? Not only in our minds, but in our actions as well. The ark travels. And the ark carried those, noset, nosav, those who were carrying the ark, were actually carried by the ark. Like the ark would just hover. Um, the com- we had the complainers, people who were dissatisfac- that is dissatisfied with the mana. We had Moshe is in despair. He's like, what's wrong with these people? We have the establishment of the Sanhedrin. We have the new prophets uh, that, were, that were established. And then we see in verse 3 of chapter 12 that Moses is humble more than any other man. And we always are stumped with this question, how is it possible that Moses, the author of the Torah, obviously it's, he's writing what God tells him to write, right? why is he writing in the Torah that he is the most humble of all men? That's a little bit lack of humility. It would seem for someone to be self-declaringly most humble. Right? So what's the answer? Yeah, he told him. Well, told him well, 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 well. Let's remember what humility is. Humility doesn't mean I'm a nothing. Humility doesn't mean that you ignore your qualities. On the contrary, humility means knowing the qualities that were gifted to you 
and remembering that they were a gift. Remembering that they're a gift. Remembering that they're a gift from God. They don't belong to you. They're on loan to you. They're on loan to you. All of these qualities that you have, guess what? They're a gift from God. Remember that they're a gift from God and don't get too comfortable with them lest God take them away from us. And we all will have a time where our gifts are taken away from us. You know when that will be? Hopefully at the end of our lives, not during our lives. After 120. And Miriam is quarantined because she gets uh, punished for speaking Lashon Hara about Moses' wife. Okay. We have now the fourth part, the fourth portion of, the fourth parsha of Bamidbar, of Numbers. And this is when the, the, uh, the I guess, the, reject, the rejection of the land. What's the rejection of the land? They're exploring the land. Moses sends in 12 spies. And this portion's name is Shalach, where Moses sends. Shalach means to send. Shalach Lacha Anashim. The Yasuru, they should go spy out the land. Moses prays for Joshua that he shouldn't be impacted by these negative influences. Um, negative report comes back on the land and they reject the land. There's a national hysteria. Moses, please, 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 and God forgives. And he punishes with 40 years of wandering. He says, if this is the way you're behaving, 40 years, you're going to have to wander around the land, around outside of the land. And the Jews learn atonements, the offerings for sins. And we also have the commandment of tzitzit and, the, and other mitzvot that are listed at the end of the portion of Shalach. The fifth portion is rebellion. Who's rebellion? Korach. Korach. The portion is called Korach. Right? It's the rebellion against the leadership. You always have someone who's going to challenge the leadership and uh, the priesthood. God punishes him. He opens the ground beneath him. Why? Because he, God discerned. God knows what's in our hearts. God discerned this was not a altruistic argument. This was a selfish argument. And the gifts to the Kohanim are, are listed here, and we have the tithes to the Levites. The next portion is Chukas. Remember what Chukas is? The last four portions deal with... The, the, sorry. The next four portions deal with wars and battles, and we deal with the transition in this portion of, of Chukas. Chukas is the first... Um, is is the the law that no one knows the reason for? What's that? A chok. What is a chok? Chok is a law that we have no. We don't know the reason. There's a reason for everything, but we don't know where. where right? We don't know what the reason is. What's the purpose of that? Because not we don't only do things because we understand it. Right? I hope that no one here is raising children to have to understand every rule. Because if they do, you're in bad shape. Because if they don't understand or agree with your rules, they're not listening. Sometimes it has to just be a rule because I said so. God also has that for us. Do, the, do this, follow this law. You know why? <clears throat> not because you understand it. Now, and we have King Solomon begging, begging the Almighty. He says, I have all wisdom, and yet I'm far from it. I'm far from wisdom. Why? Because he didn't know the laws of, he didn't understand the reasoning behind the red heifer. So we have the first generation to the second generation uh, who will enter the land, all right? They have the red heifer. Miriam dies. There's no water. The people protest. Moshe, Moshe hits the rock. Right? And Moshe is punished not to enter the land of Israel. Now, interestingly, our sages tell us that uh, Moses, obviously this is not in the regular text of the Torah, but there was a calculation that was going on behind the scenes with Moses. Moses understood that the way in which he will leave this earth is the way in which the Jewish people will forever remain. With that yearning, or with whatever it is that he leaves this world. We're going to continue Mo Moses' legacy. Had Moses entered the land, the Jewish people would be satisfied we were in the land. And just like we're in the land, we're out of the land, okay, so what? But if Moses leaves this world with a yearning for the land of Israel, 
forever, wherever the Jewish people will be, in any exile, in any pogrom, in any, uh, you know, uh, in any type of holocaust that the Jewish people will have to endure, they will always yearn for the land of Israel. And we see that throughout the history of the Jewish people, that was always the number one yearning of the, of the Jewish people, to get to the land of Israel. We want to get to the land of Israel. And that was Moses' gift. He was ready to lose his own portion of entering into the land of Israel. But there are many reasons to why Moshe hit the rock. But again, according to this Midrash that we're sharing here, it's because his calculation was, if I enter the land, the Jewish people will never have that yearning to enter the land. And that's trouble. It's trouble if we don't have that yearning. So he wanted to leave off the Jewish people with that yearning forever. That wherever they are, they'll always want to be back in the land of Israel. It's an, it's an unbelievable thing. You don't have people saying, oh, I can't wait to get back to Sweden. Well, if they were born there, maybe they want to go visit. But the second generation, third generation, who cares? Sweden, so what? We have, we're in a new land. Right? Anybody say, oh, I have to go back to China. <clears throat> no, okay, finished. You once lived there, you're not there anymore. Goodbye. But to the land of Israel, forever we want to be back in the land of Israel. Right? So we have um, Amalek attacks, Aaron dies. We have a new challenge, which is we're going to die in the desert. All right? Because that generation was punished that they will not uh, they will not be able to enter the land of Israel. We have all the battles that the Jewish people needed to face um, in the process. Portion number seven, Balak, right? Wicked Balak and Bilam. All right, Bilam was a prophet, the most powerful prophet ever. Our sages tell us that he was much more powerful than Moses. Why was he more powerful? We mentioned this on Friday in our Parsha minute. Because the other nations shouldn't complain. Well, if we had a prophet who was as great as Moses, we would also accept the Torah. Guess what? You had a more powerful prophet than Moses, and yet you didn't accept the Torah, right? No excuses. Bilam was that prophet. God's ambiguous permission got, right? Again, we have to run through because we don't have all the time to go through this in depth. I just want everyone to know that these classes on Tuesday will continue in Torch University every Tuesday night. Uh, Rabbi Wolby will be teaching at 7 o'clock. My brother, Rabbi Yaakov, will be doing Jewish history at 7 o'clock. And then we do the Chumash at 8 o'clock. And we do it in depth. And if you don't have this yet, I would urge you to go online and buy one of these Schottenstein edition interlinear Chumash. It's all in one, uh, one volume. I urge you to, to get that before our class next week. Um, you can also get it on Amazon, I believe. Or Jumbo Judeca. <clears throat> All right, so God blocks the path of, uh, of, uh, of Bilam, and the donkey speaks. Imagine a donkey speaking to you. Guess what? We have things all around us that are talking to us. We just have to wake up and hear that sound, right? We have to hear the voice. It's a message. Everything around us is a message. And we have the first blessing that he gives the Jewish people instead of a curse. And Balak is angered what's going on. We have a second blessing that's blessed to the Jewish people uh, instead of a curse. Because if God decides that you will not do harm to the Jewish people, you won't. With whatever might you have, with whatever strength, it will be unsuccessful. And Balak is angered again. We have a third blessing that goes to the Jewish people. We have Bilam's last prophecy. And Bilam uh, plots to infiltrate the Jews with the Midianite women. He says, you know what? I can't, I can't divert the Jews from outside with a curse because God doesn't allow it. I'm going to have to infiltrate from inside. How am I going to do that? I'm going to bring the Midianite women. They're going to attract the Jewish men. And boom, what's going to happen is they're going to want to be with these Midianite women and then they're going to disappear from within. This is not the only time in history where the non-Jews have tried this plot. By the way, in less than a month, we're going to be celebrating the holiday of Purim, which is the exact same plot of Haman. He says, if we're going to make a party for the, for the entire people of Shushan, and then the Jews are going to be, uh, you know, uh, they're going to be tempted to join this party. And then once we reel them in, 
then we'll be able to feed them non, non-kosher food. We'll be able to attract our young, young women to their men. And then before you know it, from within, because we know that the Jewish God is very powerful, and He will protect them unless they sin. If we're able to get them to sin, then, then we have them. Then they're in our hands. So the only way to get to the Jewish people is by making us sin. And what happens? We know that Pinchas it demonstrates pure, pure, okay, meaning in the purest way, what it means to be a zealous Jew. Not for his own anger, not because he was angry at his family or angry at a bad business deal and now he's going to let it out at someone. He was for the, for the sake of the Jewish people, for the sake of God's glory. He sees that there is a couple doing inappropriate acts in public and he takes a spear and sticks it through both of them. And this was an example. He was rewarded for this because he was elevated to a status of Kohen after the fact that the Kohen's already were just, the Kohen status was already given, he was added to that. Um, so Pinchas is, is greatly rewarded in the portion named Pinchas. Um, and these last three portions deal with the inheritance of the land of Israel. Moses orders an attack on Midian. We have a new census, and the total count here is 601,730. We are down uh, almost 200,000, sorry, down 2,000. Uh, men from when we counted at the beginning of the book of Numbers. And the daughters of Tzalach Fchad are complaining, we want a portion of the land. We don't have a father, so we're not going to get a portion of the land of Israel. And they indeed get a portion uh, of land in the land of Israel. We have all the laws and inheritance. God shows Moses the land, and Moses asks for a successor, and we have the festive offerings listed in this por- portion of Pinchas. Then we have the portion of Matos. The ninth of the ten portions in Numbers. And we have the laws of vows and oaths. We have the battle against Midian again. We have the laws of koshering utensils because when you go into the land, you're going to take away all the spoils and all of the whatever's of the Midianites. Guess what? What are you going to do with all of their pots and pans? You have to kosher it. Just like we have to do when we buy new pots and pans, we have to dip them in a mikvah, why? Because they may have been used, uh, may have been in the process of their creation or any parts that are assembled in this, uh, in this uh, utensil uh, may, be, uh, may have been used for idolatry. And therefore we dip it in the mikvah to sort of purify it. But what's if it was used by someone? Certain utensils, depending on what they're made of, can be koshered. And koshered is a process, we can talk about it another time. Uh, but there's a process of koshering utensils. It's not a very long process, but it's got to be done right. We have the division, division of spoils. Reuven and God ask for a special inheritance. They want to be in the land of Jordan. Jordan. Very good. And as we know, <laughs> just interestingly, we'll see soon that we had the the uh, we had the um, the cities of refuge. That's three cities of refuge refuge in the land of Israel and three cities of refuge in the land of Jordan. (coughs) Does not make any sense? You only had two tribes in Jordan and the other ten tribes in the land of Israel. Why would you need three cities of refuge in the land of Israel and three cities of refuge where there are only two tribes in Jordan? So sages tell us, because in Israel we have a special protection in the land of Israel. There's a special holiness. There's a special uh, uh, blessing that is brought to the Jewish people in the land of Israel. So there's less murder. There's less erroneous murder. Or, uh, or, or um, And the whole, the whole idea of, of city of refuge we'll discuss another time. We actually discussed that in our beginning of Talmud. When we started learning Talmud, uh, Talmud Lunch and Learn, uh, we started when we were learning the Tractate of Makot. All right. And we got into the discussion of lashes. You remember that, right? Okay. So we have the division of spoils. Okay. Moses has an objection to them receiving the, the land in, in uh, jo- Jordan. And instead, they work out a solution. The request is worked out. He says, you know what? I'll give you that part. Your, your portion of land in Jordan, but you first have to come help us conquer the ten tribes of Israel, 
the land of Israel. And once we're done, then you can go to Jordan. And so they did. And the last portion, the tenth portion in Numbers, the book of Numbers, is a summary of, uh, of the journey. We have occupying the land, the boundaries of the land, leadership. Right? It's very important. Leadership has to be worked through in advance. You can't just have a transition like that. It has to be a, pro a, pro a process. We have the cities for the Levites, the cities of refuge, like we mentioned earlier. And then we have the tribal intermarriage between the tribes. That is the end of the book of Numbers. We have 10 portions, 36 chapters, 1,288 verses in the book of Numbers. And now we begin the final book of the Torah, which according to our sages is a review of the entire book of the Torah. And it is called Deuteronomy. It's a review of the Torah. It's the final speech to the nation. And it is a warning uh, for the Jewish people to stay inside the limits of the Jewish people. There are 11 portions in this book, and in all of the book, all of the book of Deuteronomy is a total of 36 days. Remember Genesis? Remember how many, how many years that was? Just the first two portions was 2,023 years. Just the first two portions. Here, the last 11 portions, 36 days. And these are the last 36 days of Moses' life. So it begins as follows. Moshe and the nation, there is rebuke. Judaism is a way of life. It's not a, you know, it's like they say a diet. It's not, it's not, it's not a diet. It's a way of life, right? Judaism, it's not Judaism. It's a way of life. We say Judaism is a relationship. You have to get into the frame of mind of that relationship. The frame of mind. It's a constant connection with the Almighty. In how we eat, in how we sleep, in how we, how we spend time, in how we spend our week, in our weekend, and everything that we do as Jews has an influence of God in it, or should have, and be infused with godliness. Uh, we're, we appoint the judges, we're recalling the spies, and the commandment to march into the land, and the inheritance of the land again is reviewed. Va'et Hanan, the second portion, is God, the Torah, and the commandments. Moses prays again to see the land, God says, enough is enough is enough. Stop with your prayers. Uh, never forget what you've seen in the land of Egypt, right? The splitting of the sea, the exiles. We have the Ten Commandments reviewed. We have the Shema part one. We have the review of Exodus five and six. Uh, reminder not to be too comfortable. We say this in the Shema. Time and again, when the Jewish people are too comfortable, they sin, they fall away. They disappear. Don't be too comfortable. Don't go after your eyes and after your heart. Don't run after your temptations. We say also, we say in, in the Vahayim in Shema, the, be careful that if you get too comfortable, the Chara Af Hashem Bachem, God's wrath will be after you. God's anger will go after you. You got to be careful. It's a warning we constantly have as Jews not to fall to luxuries, not to fall to materialism, not to fall to comforts. Because once we do, our connection with Hashem is, is diminished or in jeopardy. So it's a reminder not to be too comfortable. And we have the mitzvah to trust in God. It was the, it was the mid that we spoke about yesterday in our Muslim Mondays. Um, you can watch that on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, and teach your children that you are a holy nation. You're a holy nation, and as such, as a holy nation, you're expected to act holy. Holy means to sometimes be separated, to be separated from other influences, to be distinguished. We have a commandment to be different from the nations of the world. We have a commandment, right, in the way we dress, in the way we speak, in the, way we, in the way we call ourselves, the names, we have to distinguish ourselves. That's why the Jewish people merited to exit the land of Egypt, because they didn't change their language, they didn't change their names, and they didn't change their clothes. They dressed like Jews, they, they called they had their names like Jews, 
and the and the um, and they spoke like Jews. Okay, and they called each other by their by their Jewish name. So we have like this: the teach your children. It's a tremendous mitzvah to teach our children Torah. It's one of the amazing things that we have constant reminders. We have mitzvahs which are specifically like Passover. Is a mitzvah to sit with your children and tell them what happened in Egypt every year, again and again and again. Asher it's a sicha me'eretz mitzrayim. You have to tell it to your children. God took us out of Egypt so that we can sit here and learn and talk about this. We have to constantly speak it over with our children. Special mitzvah to teach Torah to our children. Third portion is Akef. Uh, now the next four are talking about the preparation for the land of Israel. We have the concepts, we have the influences, we have the administration, and we have the social code. So let's go as follows. Concepts. Parshas Akev. Third portion. It's reward for good deeds, reassurance and security. Lessons of, food, of the food and mana, miracles in the desert. And we have a warning against the law of prosperity. Again. We have a, to, a mitzvah to remember Egypt. A temporary ark is built. We have a second set of tablets. Aaron's death. Again, this is a review, if you remember, if this is from Exodus already. Uh, the, towards the end of Exodus, we have uh, greatness and promotion of the Levites. All God wants from us. What does God want from us? Relationship. Relationship. What is that again? Effort. Effort. God wants us... Put an effort forward in this relationship. Right? God wants our heart. God wants our heart. And that's it. That's chapter 10, verse 12. And when we have first-hand witness of the miracles, and uh, which is a, an amazing thing that we all witnessed as, as being part of the Jewish people at the foot of Mount Sinai. It was a national revelation. It wasn't what other religions have as an individual revelation. This is a, a national revelation, which is, again, different than any, any other religion can, can test, uh, testify to. We have the greatness of the land, and then we have Shema part two. In portion of Re'eh, we have the influences. We have choices of blessing or curse. It's your choice. Pick whichever one you want, life or death. It's your choice. God says, Re'eh, natati lofanecha yom et hachayim et hatov et hamovet et here, behold, I place before you today life and death, good and bad. What do you choose? I, God says, my recommendation, you know, editor's notes. <laughs> choose good. Choose life. Okay? And the sanctity of the land is spoken about where if we observe the, the, the laws of the Torah, the land will, will be fruitful. But if we don't, the land will spit us out. And there will be nothing. It will be desolate. And we see that throughout the history of the Jewish people, when the Jewish people were in the land, the land, like it is today, flourishes. The land is amazing. When it, nothing, there's nothing there. It was a desert land. There was nothing growing there. It was dead. It's an amazing miracle of the land. We have like this, the sanctity of land. We have offering only on God's chosen altar. We're not allowed to bring an offering here in Houston, Texas, just because we're in the mood. Right? An offering has to be done on the altar. We have the holiness of the offerings and laws of eating. Uh, we have the principles of observance, to know God, not to believe in God. To, you have to know God. Uh, don't copy the Gentiles. We have the discussion of the missionaries, the enticers, the false prophets, idolatry. All of that we're warned about. Jews are a treasured people. And then we have the review of the laws of kosher, tithes, loans, kindness. And then we have the pilgrimages, which are Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkot, the three festival holidays of Pesach, Passover, Shavuot, and, um, and uh, Sukkot, um, where we have a special mitzvah to go up to the land of Israel. Then we have Shoftim. Shoftim are judges, administration of the Jewish people. And this is the justice system. Courts and police should be established. Blemish sacrifices are forbidden. Death penalty for idolatry. Warning to listen to the judges of uh, judges uh, and sages and courts. All right, have courts and follow those rules because they have the authority to uh, to um, to uh, bring those laws to life and hold us accountable. We have the laws of kings, 
priestly gifts, prophecy, prophets, cities of refuge, antitrust, boundaries, conspiring witnesses, war, kohanim leadership, fighters, uh, a fighter's qualifications. All right, what is it? What's the qualification to go into the Jewish Jewish army? You have to be a Torah scholar. You think, oh, whoever has the biggest muscles. No, no, no. We fight different types of wars. We don't fight wars of might. We fight wars of, of faith. And the, only the greatest, most, highest ranking believers and seekers of God were the ones chosen to fight in the war. You'll see an interesting thing in a minute. that We have the, law, the, the teachings of peace, fruit trees that are not supposed to be cut, and unsolved murders and axed heifer. Kitetse, which is the sixth portion in Deuteronomy, deals with the social code. Woman of a beautiful form during war. Man goes out to war. Now again, who went out to war? The Torah scholars. He meets this beautiful woman on the battlefield. And he wants to marry her. And the Torah tells us what are the laws regarding such a situation. You're wondering to yourself, what? I mean, these are the sages. What's wrong with them? Well, God understands the nature of man how man could be overcome in a challenge. And therefore, God created the out before you're in. Guess what? If you're faced with such a challenge, just know we, we give you the ability to marry her. And then he'll say, okay, you know what? I don't need it that bad. Right? It's sort of when you have the bread in the basket, you're not hungry. Right? That's the concept of the Talmud. But um, either way, we see a tremendous sensitivity uh, to the Jewish value for women. Where in such a case, an, unschol an unscholarly view of this portion can give one the, the, uh, the notion that, oh, we don't care about women, and oh, if you just meet this woman in the, in the battlefield and you want to marry her, no problem. The Torah says no problem because the women don't mean anything in the Torah anyway. No, it's just the opposite. If you look carefully at the details of the Torah, and specifically this mitzvah, you see how powerful the appreciation and respect the Torah has for women. So we can get into this, but you don't have enough time. We don't have enough time because we have another class starting in seven minutes. So we got to get moving here. We've only about six portions to go, so we're good. Um, so we have the, the woman of beautiful form during the war. We have the firstborn rites, wayward son, hanging and burial, uh, which is, again, for those who are taken out to, 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 to be executed by the court, they'd be hung and buried that day. We wouldn't let them be hung over, hanging overnight. Uh, the concern for others' property, we talk about the lost objects. If you find a, a lost object, you're walking out of here and you find some money on the floor, right? it doesn't belong to you perhaps, you didn't lose it. You look in your pocket. Yeah, it's not yours. So there's a special mitzvah to find the right, the rightful owner. It's a mitzvah in the Torah. We have the distinction between male and female garments. A man is not supposed to wear women's garments. A woman's not supposed to wear man's garments. Which is, by the way, the argument, the basic argument as to why men generally in in Torah observant life styles do not wear rings because women, a ring, jewelry, is a woman's garment, not a man's. <coughs> right? That doesn't mean that it's a sin for a man to wear it. Again, there's, there's customs. In, you have to know different countries have different customs and so on and so forth. But the general principle, I think, is pretty clear that men need to be men and women need to be women and it's perfectly fine. There's no need to be ashamed of being a woman or a man and uh, let's leave it at that. Laws <coughs> of Shiloh HaKen, which is sending away the mother bird before taking the child. Uh, again, a, a mitzvah of tremendous mercy. Uh, building a fence on a roof. So you, you have responsibility and accountability for your property that people shouldn't fall down. So if you have a roof that people can walk on, uh, a regular rooftop or one of those buildings in New York City, you have to have a fence around it. It's a mitzvah in the Torah to build a fence because if you don't have a fence, what's going to happen? Someone may fall off, and we don't put ourselves in a place of risk, <coughs> of danger. Uh, we have the laws of tzitzit, of motzi shemra. Motzi shemra is if you put out a, a false statement about someone else. If you put out a true statement that's negative about someone else, that's lashon ara. 
another prohibition of the Torah repeated multiple times. But if it's true, sorry, if it's true, it's, it's Lashon Ara. If it's false, it's Motzi Shemra. Motzi Shemra is a terrible thing, also a pro- prohibition of Torah. We have the restriction of adultery, restricted marriages, forbidden to marry non-Jews. We have the, forbid- the, the prohibition for marrying the Moavite or Ammonite males to marry into the Jewish people. We have the sanctity of the people, slaves and sexuality. Uh, interest, we don't, if, we, if someone asks us for a loan, we're not allowed to charge interest. Obviously, there are uh, permissions uh, for business purposes, so if you're if you're loaning like in banks in Israel, they have a special document of permission for business. It's different than if someone comes to ask you for a loan, you're not allowed to charge interest on that either. On that, we have the laws of vows, workers' rights, divorce and remarriage, kidnapping, tzaras, which is uh, uh, um, leprosy. Thank you, slander, debtor. Timely payment of workers. If you know, by the way, you lend someone money and you know that they can't pay you back for whatever reason, you're not allowed to ask them for the money because it's going to cause them extra pain. If someone borrows money from you and they give you back the money and they say, you know what, here's an extra 10 bucks. You're not allowed to take that extra 10 bucks. It's like interest. You're not allowed to accept it. If they give you a bouquet of flowers with it, you're not allowed to accept it because it's, it's a form of interest. They're paying on top of the loan. There's a question in Allah whether or not they're allowed to say thank you. Because the thank you could be an extra interest that they're paying. Right? Okay, at least it's a question. I can guarantee you at the end of the day, you have to be a mensch. That's what we learn, right? The first thing you have to do in the Torah is be a mensch. So no question, from the aspect of, of being a mensch, you have to say thank you. But you have to be careful to what extent that thank you is, uh, is, is pronounced with a gift or with something, a notice, uh, to, to notice that, to recognize that gift. You have to be careful about that. But the Torah is very, very, uh, the, the morals and ethics of the Torah are really incredible. We have uh, timely payment of work to workers, orphans and widows. Uh, the Torah gives us a special emphasis of how important it is to take care of them and to treat them with very, very, very delicate kid gloves uh, to ensure not to hurt them. The gifts to the poor, lashes, uh, leverite, leverite marriages and chalitza are also discussed in this portion not to embarrass others not to murder and uh, honest weight and measures and remember Amalek and the terrible things that they have done next, the seventh portion is kitavo when you enter the land we have the blessings and the curses again if you follow my ordinances, great, you'll be blessed if you don't, you'll be cursed, be careful we have the fruit trees, the tithes, inseparable relationship between God and Israel. We have the new commandment of the Torah, new commandment of the Torah, to, uh, new, sorry, new commitment to the Torah, uh, a renewed commitment. Uh, we have blessing and curses for observance of all mitzvahs. We have the two mountains, the Har Grizim and Har Evo, and the consequence of, uh, of someone who does not perform properly the mitzvahs of the Torah. We have Moses' final charge till the end of the Torah is right here. The next four portions are the last four portions of the Torah. We have the freedom of choice. We have leadership transfer. We have the song that the Jewish people sing. And then the last day of Moses' life. So it goes as follows. There's a renewal of the covenant, warning for idolatry, an eventual redemption that's going to come speedily, hopefully in our days. That's a promise in the Torah. And 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 repentance. Um, you can access the Torah. The Torah reminds us that the Torah is within all of our reach. No one should say, you know, I'm a sinner rabbi. I don't think God wants to see me. I don't think God wants to hear anything from me. That's not true. God loves us, every single one of us. And God wants our prayers. And God wants our Torah study. And anybody can attain the Torah. Anybody who sets their mind to it and their heart to it. You just got to start learning the Torah. Put your heart to it and you got it. Choose life. It's your choice. Good or bad, life or death. The next portion, Vayelech, leadership transfer. Moshe leaves. The new Joshua, the new leader Joshua is selected. The Hakel, he has the gathering of the people. And the Torah itself is a testimony to our truth, true religion. Right, the Torah itself, and I can explain that shortly. Um, just be, we'll just finish off two more quick portions here. We have the Song of Moses. 
We have God's kindness to Israel. The prosperity brings uh, disillusion. Again, it's a warning. Be careful of, of, of being too prosperous. God's wrath, source of Israel's suffering. Israel is comforted. And we have the last commandment given to Moses to write a Torah. Moses, the man of God, that's the only eulogy given about Moses. Three words in English, two words in Hebrew. Man of God, or actually servant of Hashem. Evid Hashem. That's it. That's the eulogy. Why? Our sages teach us, whatever a servant acquires, the master acquires. A servant has no independence. A servant has no rights. Moses lived his life like that. Everything that he had was for his God, was for his relationship with God. Everything he did was for God. And um, that's the way he lived his life. He blesses each tribe, gives each a copy of the Torah. Moses, Moses, Moses sees the land, and we have the death of Moses. Moshe is eulogized, again, as a servant of God. And we have the burial place is unknown, where Moses is buried. And Moses' greatness, there will be no prophet like him. And the Jews mourn 30 days for Moses. Mazel tov to all of you. This is the, the conclusion of the Torah crash course. Now, before we finish, I just want to leave off with one little idea. Is that the Torah itself is a testimony to its truth. So we've, we've mentioned this example a few times in the past. And that is, imagine that I give you all a Torah here today and I say, here you go. This is your Torah. I am your God because I took you out of Katy and brought you to Sugarland. Right? Here's your Torah. Follow my ordinances. Everything that's written inside it. And my name is not David Koresh. Right? So, what would happen? You walk outside and you look and you're like, what? He never took us out of Katie. He never brought us to sugar. What is he talking about? This guy's nuts. He's been drinking, smoking something, right? Not God. Yeah, not, God. Uh, not, not God, right? It can't be. And especially, I'm going to give it to all of you here, the masses here in this room, and it's going to be like, this guy's crazy. There's a trash bin right outside. You'll take what I consider to be that Torah and you'll throw it right in there to be recycled, right? I'm not listening to this crazy guy. He's going to tell me all these all these insane commandments, right? Why would I keep them? But if what I wrote in there was actu was accurate, and the promises that I that I make in the name of Hashem are fulfilled, like the ten plagues, and the splitting of the sea, and the manna in the desert, and the ten commandments, and all of the amazing miracles that the Jewish people have seen, and it's all written in the Torah, and everybody has a copy of it, and it's accurate to a T. To every single experience that every Jew saw and recognized and experienced. That itself is a testimony. It's a national revelation. Because imagine if one thing is written in the Torah that isn't accurate, what would happen? All of it, it invalidates the entire book. If there's one fact that is inaccurate, who knows what else is inaccurate? Which, by the way, is the big challenge with this new modern, uh, uh, I guess, effort that people have of calling Bible criticism. This sort of criticizing the Torah. That's the arrogance of, of, of mankind thinking that they're smarter than God, greater than God, and it's a very dangerous place to go to. Because if you don't believe in the accuracy of the Torah, then... What's the next thing you don't believe in? God. God and all of the commandments go out the window because if I don't understand, if my arrogant self, my arrogant little mind can't understand the godly expressions behind the mitzvah, then it must be nonsense, right? God forbid. It's very important to learn the Torah, to understand the Torah, to know it, and to live it. It's not enough to just know Torah. Oh, I learned, I go to Rabbi Wobi's classes. Oh, I love those classes. Great. God bless you. It's not about only learning. It's about doing. It's about observing them. It's taking a mitzvah and making it part of your life. It's taking another mitzvah and making it part of your life. 
So in the study of Torah, the study of Torah is critically important. It's what kept the Jewish people alive throughout our history. But if we only learn and we don't observe, we're going to get into problems. So good luck on your journey. I look forward to continuing our learning. Tomorrow night, Partners in Torah, right here at 8 o'clock. And every day we have classes here. Every day. Right now we're going to have Rabbi Yaakov Wolby. He's going to finish up the five millennia in five weeks. Go get some coffee, some snacks. Buckle up because you got another uh, two hours to go. All right. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you for joining us.